Let's rock, baby. Let me ask a question on your behalf. Why isn't this the first video in the series? This review series exists to cover the playable characters of the Devil May Cry franchise from a gameplay-first perspective. My point being that the Devil May Cry series focuses heavily on crafting characters with interesting and technically expressive movesets that are both enjoyable and showcase the personality of whatever character you're playing as. The games are explicitly crafted around this, allowing for a wide range of tactics and, by result, a high degree of player expression. Other aspects of these games are subservient to that. World design tends to be a secondary, at most, interest, and enemies are primarily designed to let you get your hits in with minimal exceptions. You're mobile, powerful, and with some practice the game will become your playground. That is how the Devil May Cry franchise is. Starting with Devil May Cry 3. While elements of what I said are applicable to the original Devil May Cry, it is undeniably something different. We're going to have to spend a lot more time talking about the game surrounding the character this time around. This is going to be another long and slow one, so lay back and chill. Before I explain more, let's roll the intro and get into the first proper part of the video. Part 1. What is Devil May Cry? The original DMC is a revolutionary game, but still has a faint whiff of Junko, Janko, fucking JNCO genes on it. It's of its time, and frankly, it's kind of hard to talk about because it doesn't quite have the same priorities of the later games. The load bearing word there is quite. It's not super far off, but enough so that the differences can feel at times very drastic. So right now, I'm going to explain the original Devil May Cry to you as if you know nothing about it. Then I'm going to lay in the details. Devil May Cry is a 2001 action horror game released originally on the PS2. You play as Dante, the half-demon devil hunter who is on a quest to avenge his dead mother and brother by defeating the Dark Lord Mundus a powerful demon his father, Sparta, sealed 2,000 years prior. Over 23 missions, Dante will explore and fight through Malay Island, a castle island once ruled by Castilians, but now thoroughly corrupted by demons. Let's stop there. First of all, I want to stand by calling this an action horror game. The original DMC is a lot more focused on horror game tropes than any of its sequels. There are honest to god jump scares in this game. Most fights feel like being jumped. In fact, you can be hit right out of cutscenes. The last third of this game takes place in an alternate, darker version of the first third. There's even the mirror dimension and even more hellish demon world below. Silent Hill does something pretty similar to that. Now you were definitely at an advantage in this game, unlike the old Resident Evil games DMC was birthed out of, but that advantage primarily comes through knowledge, and without that knowledge this game can be incredibly unforgiving. The point I'm leading into here is that Devil May Cry was not exclusively a game about you expressing your mastery of a character. It was a game where you took a capable character through a difficult situation, and your mastery of the game had less to do with Twitch input control, and a lot more with finding secret missions and learning tricks. I'm being a bit vague here, so just trust me when I say we will go into far more detail about the minutiae of DMC after I introduce to you the original version of Dante. Part 2. Who is Dante? Again, this is a tough one. Let's be real right, the writing in the original DMC isn't stellar. Hell, the subtitles even have grammar mistakes, and characters tend to say questionable things. Let's open a window, clear it out in here, and get to the core of what Dante is supposed to be in this game. Dante is the roughly 28-year-old demon-hunting proprietor of the Devil May Cry business. Devil May Cry is supposed to be a general handyman shop to anyone who doesn't have a secret password. A reality that should be dispelled by anyone walking into this place and seeing demons nailed to the walls with all these swords. Dante is a confident, cocky guy who, whoa, spoiler alert, is also a half-demon himself. In particular, he is the son of the legendary Dark Knight Sparta, who woke up to justice 2,000 years prior and saved the human world from destruction. Dante's absurd durability, 
at least in cutscenes, allows him to talk shit and tank getting hit. Dante's primary motivation, and the real reason he hunts demons, is to eventually find and kill Mundus, the Prince of Darkness whose actions led to the death of his mother and brother 20 years prior. Shut up, don't tell him. Dante is characterized as slightly theatrical, but otherwise a professional. His moveset isn't nearly as expressive as it will be in later games, and we'll get into that. Here's where things get awkward. Dante's trauma from the death of his mother and brother shut up, runs so deep that he quickly becomes attached to Trish, an artificially created demon who takes the guise of his mother in a skin-tight leather outfit. At first he doesn't really show it, but later in the game this relationship causes a 10-car pile-up on the DMC expressway and Dante starts making weird sounds. Dante suffers from mediocre voice acting and iffy at best writing. However, if you accept that this is a campy action horror game, it's not hard to enjoy what is given here. DMC didn't just inherit a camera system from Resident Evil, it also inherited its writing. The dialogue feels very stilted and unnatural. Nobody talks like this. Don't come any closer, you devil! You may look like my mother, but you're nowhere close to her! You have no soul. You have the face, but you'll never have her fire! Ruben Langdon has spoken at length about how he had to rewrite much of DMC3's dialogue on the fly due to this exact issue, and I really appreciate him doing that. I far prefer that version of the Devil Hunter, and the distance between Ruben Langdon's Dante and Drew Combs' Dante is, to use a traditional American expression, like a dozen bajillion football fields. The Devil May Cry series will continue to be at least a little goofy at almost all times, yet what's remarkable about the original game is that while the story and writing are more than a little sus, everything else is pretty amazing, and especially so for the time. So for this one game, instead of going into Dante's combat, I want to talk about the location he's visiting, then his gameplay. More so than any other episode, this will be a review of the game as much as it is a review of its protagonist. Part 3, Malay Island and Exploration It's kind of crazy to think that the original Devil May Cry is the one with the most fleshed out location. Devil May Cry takes place entirely on Malay Island. We're never told explicitly where this is in the world, however references to a Castilian and Obviously European architecture gives the place an unmistakably Spanish feel. You could convincingly say that this was an island placed off the coast of Spain. Hmm. Wonder why that is. According to books found in the castle, yes you can actually inspect things, the castle that takes up a good half of the island has been slowly modified over the years to become more and more insane by successive Castilians. The place itself seems to slowly drive people to madness, with some parts of the island having an inconsistent flow of time. God, I'll just say it. Between the bizarre architecture, puzzling keys, and fixed camera angles, this is a Resident Evil mansion. I mean, it is, really. The island concept would be reused in RE4, and I'm almost dead to right certain the manor's concept became Ramon Salazar's castle in RE4 as well. As has been said many times, Devil May Cry was Resident Evil 4 at one point. But that's not a bad thing. Resident Evil 4 is just behind Ocarina of Time and games people always say on 2010 message boards are the best ever. I can picture every single room from this game in my mind easily whilst I struggle to remember even half of the environments in DMC5. Now let's talk about why you should be looking around in this game. Like in other games, there are hidden red orb caches that you just sort of have to find. You don't get Nero's glowing arm here. Secret missions, which are present in every DMC, are especially important. Despite the game rewarding exploration having an open-ended island, it still has a mission structure. Unlike every other DMC though, you cannot replay missions. Therefore, it's very easy to end up with not nearly enough red orbs to purchase much at all. Conceivably, if you're struggling with this game, you may end up spending literally all of your red orbs buying blue and purple orbs to upgrade health and devil trigger, and get no or close to no new abilities. The red orb economy in this game, without perhaps a little special knowledge, is very stingy and you'll want to allocate what you have towards new moves because of secret missions. Again, like they would in the future, reward you with blue orb fragments. 
In total, between secret missions and fragments found via exploration, there are 44 total to find. It takes 4 to make 1 blue orb, so these are 11 health upgrades. Combined with one very obvious blue orb you can find and one not so much so, this totals 13 upgrades, which is a little more than double the amount that can be purchased from the goddess statues. In addition, there is one virtually impossible to find secret mission near the end of the game that rewards an alternate use for the Devil Trigger Gauge. We will talk about this more later. If you choose to not participate in this game's exploration and try to beat the game with nothing but your Twitch skills, then I'm sorry to say you're probably going to have a bad time. First of all, your moveset is likely to be very limited, but secondly, this is not necessarily a game that prioritizes dexterity. And god, I'm saying it again, we will talk about this more later. Please make a mental note of this section as we move on. This game, more so than any of its sequels, rewards exploration and borderline demands it of you. So, eh, you know what? Let's get into greater detail on this right now. Part 3A, Secret Missions. When the original Devil May Cry used the term secret mission, it really fucking meant it. As just stated, it can be very advantageous to your literal health to do these missions, but the game often does flatly nothing to hint at their locations. These are missions that you're really only going to find if you look them up or are simply very adventurous. Let's go over a few. First, let's talk about the first secret mission, and yes, I know I haven't discussed the combat yet, just, sit me with, just stick with me for a second. In mission 3, you'll come across this bridge that falls apart. When you fall into the water, you have to fight a series of floating skulls called Sargassos while your health drains. You're forced to do this once, but if you continue to fall in, you'll continue to fight this battle. However, after you beat the boss of this level, Phantom, if you choose to go back here instead of literally going through one other door to end the mission, you can deliberately fall into the water to experience the first secret mission of the game. Secret Mission 01 Critical Hit. Aim for its weak point and defeat it with a single shot. This secret mission is pretty important. First of all, it technically introduces the concept of secret missions, although you may miss it and stumble into a different one later on. Secondly, it introduces the concept of enemies having specific exploitable weaknesses in their attack patterns. This is a core concept of this game that otherwise is never explicitly addressed. You will encounter the importance of this concept in a hard way in the next mission when you fight Shadow. Finally, it establishes that the game will just straight up lie to you sometimes. In this secret mission, you'll be fighting the Sin Scissors, an enemy that returned for DMC5. Basically, you want to swipe away their scissors when they're fully opened and then blast them with a shotgun. Ideally, this will kill them in one hit, but it doesn't always do so. If it doesn't, then I imagine you'd believe you failed the mission. You have not failed the mission though. The actual rule is that you can only do damage to the Sin Scissors while they're in this state, not that it be a one-hit kill. Still, since the game lied about the mission objective and it isn't communicated well when you're doing critical hit damage, you're likely just to take the mission as a wash from here and ignore the critical hits just blasting away. All of this presuming you even find out what a weak point is. So, this secret mission gives you a blue orb fragment, which is important, it introduces critical hits, which is important, it introduces the concept of a secret mission, which is important, but it is legitimately hidden and doesn't communicate its objective well at all. Also your health drains while you're in it. It's kind of a bizarre shame, as this is my least favorite secret mission in the game while also being the very first. Hey, you know what? Screw it. Let's talk about all the secret missions. The next two secret missions are, by some margin, way easier. All you need to do is walk over some tiny phantom babies. Just walk on them. That's it. Then, time for Whiplash, as Secret Mission 4 has the unique distinction of only allowing one attempt per playthrough. Fight the Shadow, you only have one chance. Again, lies. You don't fight the Shadow. You fight three Shadows right after the enemy type is introduced. Secret Mission 5 is another important one. It introduces the idea of enemies damaging each other. This isn't something that happens naturally often, but knowledge of this fact can be useful. 
Unfortunately, your health will be draining during the secret mission unless you take advantage of something that we again did again we will talk about it later. Secret Mission 6 is yet another important secret mission. This one requires the use of Enemy Step to grab the Blue Orb Fragment and end the mission. Enemy Step is one of the core abilities of not just this game, but the whole damn series, and this is the mission that really tests you to take advantage of it. Secret Mission 7 is a final test of the underwater gameplay. We'll talk about that in the gameplay section. Secret Mission 8 is the only secret mission in the game that I'm convinced actually has a hint towards accessing it. If you inspect this wall during Mission 14, it basically states to come back at a later time. If you do so during Mission 15, this same wall becomes the trigger for Secret Mission 8. This time you fight three shadows again, but you can actually retry it. Secret Mission 9 also requires Enemy Step. Bizarrely, it's way easier than the previous Enemy Step Secret Mission. Just Enemy Step up the Sargassos and that's it. Secret Mission 10 has you fighting four shadows, but they're separated. You have to find them by walking around. This is the easiest secret mission with shadows, while also being the last. Secret Mission 11 can only be attempted once per mission start. You have to cross the broken bridge to activate the mission. Falling down or failing the mission means you have to restart mission 17 to try again. Thankfully, the secret mission is at the very beginning of the level. This one's pretty hard, requiring you to take advantage of a quirk in the enemy Death Sight's move pool when he launches you in the air. The final secret mission, Secret Mission 12, Hidden Bangle, is kind of bonkers. It's easily the longest secret mission, taking place in a mini dungeon of sorts, but where is it? Look at this screenshot. Where do you think it is? It's in this picture? Keep in mind that I'm helping you a lot here by just showing you this instead of all the other possible places it could be. Yes, that's right. In the fleshy section of the wall that's effectively identical to all the other fleshy walls around here with no hint at all it's the right spot. It's worth mentioning that there is no visible note as to what missions have what secret missions or items in them so I totally missed this one in the first few times I played through this game. This one provides the final full blue orb, as well as the Bangle of Time, an item that would be repurposed in Bayonetta, and has the same effect as DMC 3's Quicksilver in this game. Allow me to repeat this. This video series is primarily concerned with the playable characters of the Devil May Cry franchise, their personalities, and their movesets. The reason I feel I need to discuss these secret missions is that the secret missions provide something more than blue or fragments. They provide knowledge in a game where it couldn't be more important. These secret missions are very focused on teaching you core concepts of the game otherwise never advertises like the weak points on enemies and proper use of enemy step. Tutorials are very limited. There is no void. And if you don't do these missions, you're likely to not buy a lot of new moves and walk away from the game frustrated or unsatisfied. Your Dante won't be as fun as my Dante. There is an in-game glossary that covers some enemy weak points, but for one, you're never told how to fill it up, and for two, most people I know who've played this game forgot or never knew this glossary existed. Also, again, 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 Dante's moveset in this game isn't extensive and can be handicapped even more if you don't do these missions and waste your orbs on health upgrades or, god forbid, vital stars. I have personally found that every single DMC after this is far more forgiving with red orb income and since they also allow for mission replaying, it isn't hard to just farm them real quick. You are given no such luxury in this game, and sticking around in any given mission is a good way to guarantee an awful end of mission rank. Most of the secret missions aren't strikingly difficult, I just wish they were better communicated to the player. In the series later on, this would be done in very obvious ways, but I'm not against them being real secrets. Just give me some hints, you know? Part 3B Level Design We're moving back to talking about the island again. Technically speaking, the first four Devil May Cry games all take place in relatively open level spaces. You can go back, forward, left, right, whatever. Unfortunately, I believe only the first and third games really establish you as a character in a specific location that you can explore. 
DMC2 is a mess, and DMC4 is so segmented and linear that you might as well just be moving from level to level. Between DMC1 and 3, it's the first game that takes the cake with level design. At no point in this game did I feel confused for more than a few moments on where to go. Meanwhile, in DMC3, there's that goddamn tower rotation puzzle that I forget the sequence for every time. DMC1 also expects you to use your moveset to get around. There are multiple secrets that can only be acquired with usage of Air Raid or Stinger, moves that must be bought from the shop. Part of the reason why the secret missions are so secretive is this level design. Thanks to proper signposting and well-described hints at the beginning of levels, it's quite rare to ever question your direction. Malay Island never doesn't feel like a lived-in place despite that. Because there's always a side path and different directions are relevant at different times, Malay Island does feel like a plausible location. Plausible, I mean, not realistic. Here's one good example and a real simple one at that. Mission 5, Guiding of the Soul, is a mission on a time limit. Quote, Go to the destination before the power of the melancholy soul fades away. The destination is this door, found at the bottom of a stairway you accessed on the way to this mission. Many players likely have already fallen down here, but the time limit is strict enough that you would have to presume the location would be really near to the start of the mission. By doing only a slight amount of mental deductive work, this mission can be completed in under two minutes. By the way, I checked because I never failed prior, but if you wait out the time limit, it doesn't fail the mission. Instead, you get an updated Mission 5 where you must recharge the Melancholy Soul at a statue you definitely passed by earlier. Not very hard, either. The sequence of locations in this game is interesting. First you start in the castle, then move on to the gardens, back to the castle at night where it has become the Nightmare Castle, and finally you travel to the Demon World. There's a noted markup in hostility every time you move on to a next section, which really fits a pseudo-horror game like this. As I'll continue to hint through this video, I'm interested in seeing this game remade by Capcom. Not because it's bad or poorly aged per se, but rather I'm curious to see what the modern Devil May Cry team could make out of this one. And make Dante more congruous with his later iterations, of course. No DMC game after this one cared that significantly about the world it takes place in. DMC 3 had some inclination, yet also isn't as stunning. I'd like to see what the current dev team could do if they put that extra effort in world design with the combination of the gameplay they've become so well known for. This isn't to replace the original Devil May Cry, no, just to provide a remix and put our modern Dante into this situation and see what happens. So that's enough about walking around. Let's uh, actually talk about the gameplay now. <laughs> Part 4. Gameplay. However far we are into this video, it's probably been too long. Anyways, I think you'll find that this game works in interesting and sometimes illogical ways. We're now going to cover Dante's complete moveset, one melee weapon type at a time and then summarizing all the guns in one section. Please keep in mind that I will be using the HD collection slash Japanese controls for visual and spoken reference. I find it hard to explain why, but we all know that melee on circle is just plain awkward. Part 4A The Swords at the beginning of Devil May Cry, Dante only has access to Ebony and Ivory for guns and Force Edge as his sword. Starting in Mission 2, you get a direct upgrade to this weapon in Alistair. Let's talk about Force Edge for a second though. Its moveset is extremely limited. You have no access to Devil Trigger and it only has a total of 5 potential actions. There's the default 3 button combo, just triangle or Y three times. Then we get to the first kind of awkward inclusion in this game. Combo 2 is done by pressing the button twice, pausing for just a moment, and then pressing it twice more. Combo 3 is done by pressing the button twice, then pausing for just a little bit more than a moment, and then you mash it. The timing on this is straight up awkward and is also never explained. These three combos do not appear on the actions list for this sword, nor the others. If my memory serves correctly, there isn't a single other combo chain in the series that operates quite like this, where there is both an option for a pause and a slightly longer pause. If there is, and isn't common, and frankly I think we're better without this option, it's a weird timing and prevents ease of combos. 
Not that such a concern really matters in this game. Later on, we're going to discuss a technique that bypasses the need for these combos. High time is done by holding away from the enemy while locking on and pressing the Y or triangle button, just like in every other game. If you hold the button, you'll go up with them. In air, if you press the sword button, you'll come straight down with what I'm calling the helm breaker, but the game just says this is the second part of high time. It's also slotted into the universal action section, which implies Ifrit can do it as well, but you'll see that's not the case. So, uh, that's everything. Many people forget this, but you can switch to Force Edge any time in the entire game. It's always on your person. There's just no reason to. After you acquire Alistair, it's a straight downgrade in every way. Now, I'm thinking that even you, Josh, forgot you ever had it at all. I don't blame you. It's the point to forget about it so when it returns in a different form later in the game, it's more of a surprise and its uselessness now contrasts well with what it becomes. Well, the story at least. Moving on, we have Dante's workhorse in this game, Alistair. Alistair is introduced with what will become a tradition in this series, Dante getting chest blasted by it. Okay, I get that he heals fast, but did he really need to raise himself off the sword like that? Well, yeah, it's cool. Alistair has access to everything Force Edge had as a base. Technically, if you make no purchases, you only gain Devil Trigger over having Force Edge, but you will buy moves. First up is Stinger. Stinger is like Dante's Hadouken. It's his most iconic move, and you'll use it more than you should. Lock on, push towards the enemy, and hit that wire triangle button to suddenly stab towards the enemy in a straight line. Doing so off of the platform will launch you far horizontally. Stinger is impactful, quick, and easy to use. It takes the place as Dante's fastest Go Here Now ability, as he has no access to Trickster yet. With an upgrade, it'll go pretty far, too. Its role in the combat is to be an explosive first attack. Alternatively, it can be your salty runback, or maybe even one final slam on a weakened opponent. There are few cases where Stinger sucks. There's a good reason why when Hideaki Itsuno took over production of DMC2, it was the only thing the prior team had finalized. With the exception of some DT shenanigans, the Stinger will remain mostly unchanged throughout the franchise, but I'll always be happy to bring it up. Next up to bat is Round Trip. It's no pop superstar like Stinger, yet it has a strong cult following. Round Trip will become a staple of Dante's moveset moving forward, and we will then see variations with Virgil and Trish. Holding the sword button will cause Dante to ready, then toss Alistair into whatever enemy he's locked onto. This will basically hold them in place and switch your normal combo into a three-punch attack. This is just a real fun move and an interesting use of the sword. While it's out there, it's quite beneficial to take advantage of guns or do the one possible weapon switch combo in the game. If you press in the right stick while using Alistair, you can switch to Ifrit, which we will discuss later, and then quickly get in a hit or two with that weapon. As I just said, this is the only attack string you can do with weapon switching as the animation for the switch is quite cumbersome. Oh, hello there, air hike. This isn't an attack, this is a double jump. A double jump I really feel like should be universal with Dante's weapons like it will become in DMC4. It's always good to have a second jump, and I don't know what else to say. Locking on midair while in Devil Trigger will give you air raid. Alternatively, you can go straight into it by pressing the DT button and the gun button at the same time while in your normal form and mid-air. On its own, Air Raid is just the ability to hover around with demon wings. Then we get to the fun part. Pressing the gun button will have Dante shoot out pillars of lightning that do way more damage than you think they would. The Air Raid lightning attacks shred virtually every enemy in the game easily. Additionally, you can spam them for the entire duration of the DT as it's never stale on your style meter. I would argue for how safe, easy, and damaging this technique is, it's arguably Dante's best combat ability. Air Raid also allows for the access of a number of secret blue orbs in the game, making it pretty much invaluable. Air Raid leads into Vortex. This attack is done while in the Air Raid mode and hitting the sword button. Dante does an electric psycho crusher dealing very high damage. 
This is a quick attack unless you upgrade it, where it will keep the attack going until your devil trigger gauge runs out. We've now talked through every single listed ability for Alistair. There is also DT and the charged guns, but those are for later. Alistair has just enough that when mixed with other options in this game, they combine to ensure that it never gets stale. Alistair's attacks are communicated well and with force. They're also generally quite easy to grasp. The only move I feel has some difficulty in usage is Vortex, as it is highly committal and easy to be hit during. We're not done yet. Upon the beginning of Mission 18, Force Edge achieves its true form in the Devil Sword Sparta. It's an interesting inclusion. Without using Devil Trigger, the Devil Sword Sparta does the same damage as Alistair with Devil Trigger. And on top of that, the fact that Stinger now has more range as Sparta expands when Dante thrusts it. Round Trip has changed too, with Sparta transforming into a scythe that's capable of hitting more enemies at once. Combo 3 also has the extended reach of Stinger. The Sparta has an Achilles heel of an issue though. You cannot go into Devil Trigger while using this weapon. That means no speed increase, no healing, and no air raid or vortex. You also cannot use the right stick to switch to Ifrit. You could argue that, with all of the basic moves being better, it's a pretty fair trade, however, I regret to inform you that due to how quickly Devil Trigger is gained in this game and how powerful Air Raid is, it's honestly kind of stupid to bother with Sparta. Impossible? Definitely not. It looks great and it unquestionably feels powerful, but it just isn't as good as Alistair. That covers every version of the sword in Devil May Cry. DMC features what appears at first to be an escalating power level of one big broadsword. Generic blade to electric blade to finally a legendary demon sword scythe thing. But this is screwed up with the Sparta sword not having access to devil trigger. I'm dancing around the truth a little. Sparta does have a devil trigger where Dante becomes the spitting image of his demonic father in his traditional bug form. It is only available for a portion of the Mundus battle. There's really only two changes. Every swing has extremely extended range, and Dante's ranged attack is replaced with fireballs. I've seen some videos of this form hacked into the game, and it's supremely powerful. The attack damage is off the charts. You just never get to use it again. Now, I understand not giving the player access to this for balance reasons, but it's quite disappointing. I feel like if you beat this game on Dante Must Die, you should get access to this ability along with Super Dante. Or perhaps you should gain access to Sparta's DT all the time when you beat the game on hard mode and unlock the ability to play as Sparta himself. Or at least Dante wearing a Sparta outfit. In this costume, Dante's guns are changed from Ebony and Ivory to Sparta's signature Luce and Ombra, which still say for Tony Redgrave on them. The true funny haha comes with Sparta's unique sword. One that has zero plot relevance in this game and seems to only be here as an easter egg. The Yamato. The Yamato, arguably the most famous weapon in this series and one that is featured extensively in DMCs 3 through 5, is literally nothing more than a reskin of Alistair. It has all the same moves and numbers, the only difference is appearance. And if you DT with it, Sparta will be holding Sparta with access to Alistair's moveset. If you hold Alistair and DT, it'll still look like Alistair while Sparta goes bug mode. It's a tiny bit bizarre to see Yamato in a context like this. It's a mildly non-canon weapon that just has the same moveset as, generally speaking, European greatswords while being a thousand-folded demon-powered don't-mess-with-me teacher Itana. That's all for the swords. To be frank, I probably could have just titled this section Alistair, because it feels like the only one that truly matters. Force Edge is Alistair but shit, Sparta is Alistair without DT, and Yamato is literally just a retextured Alistair. Alistair sets a very solid foundation for this series. Before DMC was truly about being flashy, it was readable. Dante doesn't have a large moveset here, although it is a very memorable one. You will know what to do when. As we talk about Dante in later installments, we will see how this specific moveset of the sword evolves and expands in exciting ways, and we'll save further discussion for that later. Part 4b, Ifrit. 
There is only one pair of gauntlets in this game. The flame-imbued Ifrit. Or, uh, Ifrit, I guess? I don't know. That's what they say in Final Fantasy 16. I've been saying it as Ifrit for so long, I'm just gonna stick with it. The gauntlets will also become a series staple, but not quite to the degree of the sword, as they're missing from Devil May Cry 2. The moves that we're about to cover will be iterated on by Beowulf in 3, Gilgamesh in 4, and most strikingly by Balrog in 5. Ifrit is acquired in Mission 9, and there is no analog for it beforehand. It is necessary to acquire them to progress further, as there is a torch that must be lit by them in order to reach the next zone. Ironically, right after you acquire them, you are hit by the first boss battle with Griffin, a flying enemy who is rarely able to be hit on the ground. He does take good damage from Ifrit, but you're just gonna use Air Raid. Now let's talk about Ifrit's moveset. Ifrit has no pause combos. Instead, Ifrit has a four-hit combo with power button presses. Pressing Y or Triangle just does two punches and then two kicks. Ifrit's gimmick is that each press can be held for significantly more damage. Much like the basic sword combos, this set of moves isn't super expressive, but the fact that they can be held implies that Dante has inherent knowledge of how this weapon works when he first acquires it. That's pretty cool and shows how Dante, who was established as an experienced devil hunter in the game's intro, has likely done something like this before. I mean, I guess we know we have, right? Like Beowulf? Not listed is the jump kick, wire triangle midair. This is another staple of the gauntlet's moveset. It's Kami's cannon strike with a flame effect. I do wish Ifrit could have more in midair. In fact, I wish all the swords could too, but that's a change for later games. However, in the balance of this game, it's pretty clear that Ifrit is supposed to be ground focused over Alistair. Ifrit doesn't have access to air height. Instead, Ifrit gets Rolling Blaze, which adds a damaging flame effect to your jump. Using this into Cannon Strike is kind of a guaranteed combo, which is cool and one of the flashier things you can do in this game. While up there, you don't get Air Raid either, but in DT, you can do something interesting. Inferno is the closest thing Dante has to a super move in DMC. It's done by holding any direction while in midair with DT and pressing Wire Triangle. Dante immediately punches straight down at the cost of three runes on the DT gauge. Then, pillars of fire burst out of the ground around him. This is the highest single damage melee move Dante has access to. Against some enemies like Frosts and Plasmas, it does bonus damage and turns those troublesome enemies into ash instantaneously. I mention those enemies because that's when I usually use it. If you know what you're going up against, it's a huge boom. Back to Ifrit's more normal moveset. Locking on and holding back in Wire Triangle lands you with Magma Drive. This is your chargeable high time equivalent. Uppercuts are always cool. I wish I had more to say, but you've watched this video so far, and I think the vibe of Ifrit should have become pretty obvious at this point. Relatively standard and readable punches and kicks with fire effects. Balrog, this is not. I think for a first outing, this was a good choice. You establish a baseline and then snort a line designing a sick follow-up. Locking on and holding forward and then pressing Y or triangle serves up kick 13. In this game, it is a simple roundhouse kick that launches enemies away from Dante. You don't really do any distance. With DT, you get a full combo. In later games, this DT version will become the normal version of this move. Meteor is a little weird. It uses the same button combination as Magma Drive, but you have to be in DT to do it. This means that if you want a DT-powered Magma Drive, you have to activate Devil Trigger while the move is charging. Meteor launches a large circular flaming projectile. It's, it's okay. You are stationary while doing the move, and it costs DT, so it's a hard sell, honestly. You're probably better off just using the grenade gun. Weird that this is in the Ifrit moveset, yet I suppose Air Raid was a projectile too. And that's the end of Ifrit. Or is it? I want to bring up something now I didn't know about until making this video. On the DMC wiki page for Ifrit, it is mentioned that if you have the gun Nightmare Beta equipped, then while not in Devil Trigger, Ifrit's attacks with the left hand are more powerful. This is unsourced and the wiki has proven wrong to me in the past, so I went ahead and tested it. The only attack that works like this is Ifrit's very first punch. And I'll be damned, it really does more damage. This is just one of those great examples with the original Devil May Cry where knowledge is power. 
I'm pretty sure this is never mentioned anywhere in game, but it's real. If you hack the original trial version of Devil May Cry, you can find that Dante had a built-in limited hand-to-hand -hand combat system and the fire effect of Ifrit was going to be a different mode for Dante's singular sword, which was Force Edge but looked like Alistair. Much as I think that mode was intended, Ifrit feels like a secondary weapon or option to me. Its moveset is more limited, puts you in more danger, and it's less exploitable than whatever sword you're using. It's not bad, though. There's a good reason why you don't unlock it until Mission 9. If it requires mastery, with some learning and testing, you'll find parts of the game where it is the unequivocal best choice, and those charge punches never not feel impactful. Devil May Cry is not a game of great length, but between the little tricks like I showed you with Nightmare Beta, the secret missions, and other collectibles, it certainly has a depth to it. I'm sensing at this point I've probably explained half of it already, but Let's talk about Devil Trigger now. Part 4C, Devil Trigger. As you play the game, deal damage and take damage, the magical gauge, yes, that's what it's called in this game, will fill up. It's these runes here. Pressing left bumper L1 lands you this power up as long as there are three or more runes filled. Devil Trigger lasts until the bar runs out, or you can manually cancel it for the cost of one of the runes. While in demon mode, Dante moves and attacks faster, does more damage, gains access to the moves I mentioned earlier, guns other than the special nightmare beta gain electrical or fire effects, and finally Dante gets some healing over time. Relatively speaking, you can build up the magical gauge real fast, it's kind of wacky. The most disappointing part of Devil Trigger in this game is that Dante only assumes a weapon-specific demon form when attacking. Otherwise, he just looks like the faint glow of an RGB keyboard. Of course, this would be rectified almost immediately. In general, you just get DT fast. There's not much else to say there. I would maybe even reckon you accumulate Devil Trigger faster in this game than any other, especially if you use the grenade gun, which we are almost ready to talk about. This means it's pretty easy to abuse Air Raid in particular, a move that leaves you super safe and does tons of damage. I feel like most players would find this out eventually. The real test of skill is how you reaccumulate Devil Trigger once you're back on the ground. You can spend your magical gauge to power up any of your guns. Just hold the button until they glow with electricity or fire and let go. Or mash in the case of Ebony and Ivory. I very rarely do this. We will get more into this Nightmare Beta's use of DT in just a minute. Alternatively, after finishing the final secret mission, you get the Bangle of Time. This is an alternative to Devil Trigger. Pressing the same button as before has Dante stop time around him until the gauge runs out. This is pretty cool, but it doesn't last very long and you miss out on all the traditional benefits of Devil Trigger. However, worst of all, it doesn't work against bosses which makes equipping the item more of a novelty than anything else. The world, this is not. So, that's it for Devil Trigger. Let's move on to the guns. Part 4D, Guns. Dante has access to five firearms in this game. They can only be switched in the pause menu. I'd like to go ahead and hit you with a gut punch right now. In my opinion, this game, the original Devil May Cry, has the strongest guns in the series. Crazy, right? Famously, people complained about how shit the guns were, thus leading them to becoming more of an overt focus in Devil May Cry 2. Now, while automatic ebony and ivory juggling doesn't exist in this game, there is a lot more. Let's start with the pistols. The twin pistols of ebony and ivory make up Dante's first range choice. These are easily the worst guns in the game. They aren't useless, though. These guns benefit the most from the DT charging I just mentioned. Jumping on Shadow's spike attack, then using these with DT, guarantees a full health bar of damage done. Still, their damage isn't anything to write home about, especially if you went into this game expecting the guns to be as strong as many other unrelated games, maybe just taking 4 or 5 shots to end a basic enemy. They're not bad, and I think mostly serve to establish a baseline for all guns in the game. And there's juggling. Next up is another series staple in the shotgun. Dante holds out this sawed-off double barrel and just lets it rip. Then it reloads itself. Not a lot to this one, it basically works how you'd think. Good up close, and asset range. 
Let me repeat that one though. It's real good up close. Definitely does more damage than any one hit of Alistair. Now let's introduce what I suppose could be called the first advanced technique of the video. If you just sort of wiggle Dante back and forth while repeatedly firing this gun, then a lot of its reload time is cut off. This is called, and I shit you not, shotgun twitching. There is more you can do with the shotgun, including charging it up with DT, but this particular technique is useful 95% of the time. This means the shotgun is my most used gun in this game. Is it the best? Eh, that's very debatable. The grenade gun, I don't know why grenade launcher couldn't be its name, is a very powerful standard gun. It literally only has one attack, as you cannot use it midair. You shoot it, there's a good bit of recovery, and that's it. You can charge it with some of that quote-unquote magical gauge for some chunky damage too. The grenade gun is, in my opinion, the most overpowered weapon in the game. It's quite simple, actually. You can both roll and jump out of that recovery animation, thus allowing you to fire the gun way faster with the added benefit of iframes. The grenade gun shots also build up your DT at hyperspeed. This means you really only need to get like 4 or 5 shots off before you can just jump into air raid. I abuse this constantly. The technique of grenade rolling alone can basically carry you to Dante Must Die. You wipe out bosses much quicker with this technique than Dante could with any boss in DMC2 with guns only. It's finally time to cover the needle gun and thus swimming. Subsection of a subsection. Haha, <laughs> subsection. Just like with every good classic game, there tends to be a bit of water damage. For less than a cumulative hour of gameplay, maybe a half hour at absolute most, Devil May Cry is an iffy first person shooter. When you jump in the water and are jump scared by this tutorial prompt, you don't even have a way to defend yourself. Call it a horror trope. Shortly after this you come across the needle gun, a pretty sick looking firearm that for whatever reason can only be used underwater. Because it can only be used underwater, can't be influenced by Devil Trigger, and you only use it against one enemy, it's really difficult to say literally anything about it. You barely use it, it works I guess, and that's that. The final gun of the game is the Nightmare Beta. Easily the most optional out of all the weapons in this game. You actually have to go out of your way to do a bit of extra content to acquire it. Well, I thought that at least. Apparently if you don't grab it in mission 15, it'll show up on the Castilian's bed in mission 19. This is an interesting one. Every shot of Nightmare Beta costs Devil Trigger energy. You can have a max of 10 runes in this game, and a max charged Nightmare Beta costs 3 runes to fire. These shots bounce around and ignore armor, thus they can do pretty wacky damage to anything that gets hit and enemies who are trying to guard get hit through their guard. In a hallway, this is the easiest way to get an S rank on the style meter in the game. Without any energy, it just fires a piddly little laser that does next to nothing. This means that there's a real cost to this gun, and it is also virtually worthless while using Force Edge or Sparta. A neat trick with Nightmare Beta is that when you are in Devil Trigger, the shots do not cost extra, but do more damage. What I mean by that is that Nightmare Beta doesn't contribute to your DT drain when firing in DT. Nightmare Beta also has this fun trick with Ifrit, and a cool little lore tidbit of not doing any damage to the boss Nightmare. But it can't damage plasmas, which I just don't understand. And I think on that fun fact we can move on to our next section. My favorite section, Part 4E. Knowledge is power, and advanced techniques. Please allow me to continue to bludgeon you to death with the fact that knowing is more important than Twitch skills in this game. To cover some old ground, the locations of all the collectibles are really important as well as the secret missions. Now let's scratch the surface of small things you can learn to help a lot. After opening up the core of the shadows, if you repeatedly stinger it while in DT, you're guaranteed to bring them down to their critical state without being hit by the ground spikes. When you jump by the death scissors underground, the way you best know what direction they're coming from is by their shadow. The blades take significantly more damage if you break their helmets. This also opens them up to damage from ebony and ivory. This is easily done with the move Helmbreaker. They're called assaults in DMC4 and I'm not sure why. Here's a fun one. The fetishes are essentially more powerful marionettes. They have a built-in guard that counters a lot of melee hits, but if you're using Ifrit, you can use Kick 13 to kick so fast that the counter doesn't matter. Frost takes significantly more damage from Ifrit, like way more than Alistair. 
As said before, two Inferno attacks are guaranteed to take them out. Hey, did you notice that outside of the fetishes and the marionettes, you never see two types of enemies together in the same room at the same time? It never happens. There's a special way to kill Phantom in his final fight that doesn't require doing any damage to him. Just get him to jump on this glass a few times and there he goes. It's honestly easier to just kill him normally. Nightmare's cores break dependent not on damage, but rather amount of hits. Therefore, it is best to take them out with charge different punches. Here's a really important one. At the end of Mission 7, there's an intermission segment. There's a few of these in the game. During intermissions, there are no timers and no grades, so you can farm here as much as you want without worrying about that S rank. All you have to do is return from the door you ended Mission 6 on. Literally just turn around and go through the door at the start. What's super cool about this is that it allows you to do Secret Mission 5 without the health drain, and on Hard and DMD, the little courtyard has an infinitely respawning phantom to speed up the farm and practice the boss. I've farmed for hours here, and also it's just great for getting generic footage. Speaking of which, when I was getting generic footage in the plane room, a random enemy would spawn after minutes of inactivity. Uh, is this normal? Does this happen everywhere to spook some kid who forgot to pause the game in an empty room? If so, that's kind of a cool horror game thing. Now let's talk about what I'm going to call advanced techniques. Nothing here requires the kind of precision that guard flying does, so the ceiling has been lowered. The best video that already exists on this topic is a two-year-old guide by YouTuber Monarch. This video is truly fantastic, and I will be going out of my way to not cover everything he does so you have a reason to watch his video. Now, I did not learn everything from this video, but he did teach me one specific technique that is downright wacky and I want to share with you right now. Slash cancelling is a technique available in all the swords that has you stop attacking on the second swing, cancelling the move, Dante will quickly sheath the sword, then you do the first two swings again. This is never stale on the style meter and has a good track record of stunning enemies in infinite loops if you can keep it up. There's technically two ways to accomplish this, but I'm just going to stick with the easiest method. Keep in mind in what I'm about to say, the direction Dante is facing is always forward or up. Same if he is facing an enemy. The first method you could do is just move the stick from left to right, straight across. I don't like this one and it doesn't feel like it always works. You could also try a full rotation of the stick after the second hit, but you really need to do it fast. My preferred method is one Monarch mentions. Just do a tiger knee input without tapping the button. So basically a half circle that starts at back left, then ends at up right. So basically sword sword, tiger knee movement, sword. There's a small delay. You want Dante to not go into one of the combo enders. It will take a moment to get hold of, but once you've got it, the muscle memory is easy. Nello Angelo alone suffers greatly from this technique. I didn't even see the summon swords on my normal mode playthrough. Once you've got this down, you're mostly golden. However, now is the time to talk about guns. Or <laughs> at least it would be if I hadn't mentioned the shotgun twitching and grenade rolling already. It's too late for you. You already know DMC1 has the strongest guns. The last thing I'll mention is shotgun hiking. This is a technique exclusive to the marionettes and the fetishes. If you jump cancel a shotgun blast after purchasing air hike, you can repeat this technique ad nauseum, or at least until the thing falls apart. This is a super safe way to get kills, especially on higher difficulties. Kind of sucks you can't cancel Helmbreaker. I'm gonna stop it here. Are there more tricks to this game? You bet your ass there is. There's a little something something you can do with Vortex that I recommend you watch Monarch's video to find out about. Devil May Cry does not have the complexity that the later installments would become famous for, but it still has significant depth and will reward curious players. Maybe not everything aged well about this game, but that fact certainly did. Part 5, Reviewing Dante in Devil May Cry. We've gone off track a bit. But before I put this train back on the rails, I just want to cover a few final thoughts about the game of Devil May Cry itself. Devil May Cry doesn't have the best combat. It doesn't have the most balanced gameplay. It has an iffy underwater combat system, the story is questionable, the line delivery is awkward, the camera is occasionally an enemy to your survival, and it's a travesty how hard the secret missions are to come across. Yet, this is a classic video game. Do I need to really read off the positives here? I feel like I've been doing that most of the video. You can see the beginnings of a crazy combat system here. 
Gameplay is punishing, but also very rewarding. The game loves crafty players. It rewards exploration. The music is fantastic. The environments are unbelievably detailed. Virgil is in it. There are fantastic tricks to take advantage of. Devil Trigger is sick. And above all else, it provides a unified visionary package and spyglass into the future of game design. It's just cool to play if you like video games. If you like to see how video games have evolved, this is a key junction from the era of the PS1 to the era of the PS2. I spent a good chunk of time talking about pickups, exploration, and currency management in this video. I did this because, in this game, more than the sequels, it really matters. Without the element of mission replaying and easily the stingiest Red Orb economy in the series, it is easy to see many hypothetical players never experiencing anything close to what Dante can offer in combat. In the Nero video, the equivalent of this was talking about his unlock progression. I think the staff in the later games would realize that this system could screw players into having a less than optimal experience, and we will be exploring progression more when we get to those games. Well anyways, let's talk about the white-haired guy. Despite suffering from dialogue and delivery so poor it's literally a meme, there's something undeniably attractive in Dante's base elements. At this time in video games, it was generally expected that the protagonist would have a melee weapon and maybe a ranged attack. 3D action games that preceded Devil May Cry always had more limitations or lacked variety. Dante has two fleshed out melee weapons and four unique guns to use that, once unlocked, can be switched to at any time without ammo. While I'm not going to exaggerate and say this is a super flashy game, there is definitely an element of confidence to the way Dante wields his weapons that shows that this isn't his first rodeo. Dante can accurately blast enemies rapid fire with akimbo pistols while Sir Daniel awkwardly flings knives around. If you treat this as a spin-off of the Resident Evil series, then Dante is even more impressive. You'll never use a grenade launcher quite like the Son of Sparta does over in Resident Evil. This is a game of tricks. You learn the tricks like shotgun twitching, like slash canceling, like grenade rolling, and then things really make sense. In a weird way, it's almost like you're learning devil hunting techniques. As with almost any profession, the more you know, the easier it gets. I seriously appreciate the advanced techniques and all the little tricks the game has. Devil May Cry would have been a far more boring game without them, and Dante would feel more clunky and less competent. I'm kind of reminded of Guts. Sure, he has a signature weapon, but he can grab just about anything and really make it work. And for some reason there's Baylets all over DMC, so that too. If there's anything I can parse from Dante's gameplay is that he is supremely competent at what he does. There's a tiny bit of flash, but overall, it's very utilitarian. There's often best choices, but not sole choices. Should you fight Griffin with a shotgun? Probably not, but you can make it work. I've said so much already that it's hard to come up with new paragraphs for this section, so let's leave it here. Dante's a bit awkward, but he establishes a very healthy foundation for the franchise, and a useful backstory for later games to build on. We still have no clue as to why Sparta died, but a lot of the plot points in this game would prove extremely important in Devil May Cry 5. We actually get to see a bit of the day where Dante's mother died. Apparently Mundus used the Clyphod too. This is a game where knowledge and skill are heavily rewarded. It's a night and day difference. As any DMC fan is used to saying when trying to get their friends into these games, you can't just button mash. Also stop using Stinger so much. I like Dante like him in all his cringe glory. He talks funny, and I like that. I like what he is like in other games more, and honestly, Here's Your Crown in 2 is colder than anything he says in this, but I like him. Red, white, overcoat, big ass sword, and tons of guns, he just looks cool. I'm not a fashion designer, but I love his design here. It's the most professional he looks in this whole series. In 2 he's a model, in 3 he forgot to finish his outfit, in 4 he suffers from a tragic belt related accident, and in 5 he looks like he doesn't give a shit. None of these are bad, but in DMC1 he just looks more serious, and I like that. Dante has an essence of goofy coolness that was well built upon over time if you ignore DMC2 and that game that shall not be named. And I think I've finally said everything I want to say. Devil May Cry is a classic video game with some flaws. 
Dante's gameplay here created a solid base for what was to come. Remember what I said about this game when we get to DMC3. Now, I don't want to do a number rating here. So a classic out of 10. Important out of 10. You'll see how it evolves out of 10. Join me next time when I go through the difficult task of reviewing Dante and Lucia in Devil May Cry 2. That should prove to be fun. Anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.